It's amazing at exhibitions like this who you come across as you wander around and uh, today at the UK Metals Expo I wandered past this stand here said sustain on it and uh, here's our old friend Cameron Plydor Pierce from uh, Swansea University. Cam great to see you again Hi and too. I think we missed your speech it was yesterday and we we're only here today but yeah. uh, tell us what are you doing here t t at the show UK's Metals Expo and uh, what was your speech about yesterday? Okay so I'm here wearing two hats I suppose ultimately so uh, part of my role is, is to lead the Sustain Future Steel Manufacturing Research Hub, which is looking at fundamental research support for the whole of the UK steel industry uh, over a long period of time. So a nice, good, steady uh, piece of funding to support uh, the future of the UK steel industry. Yeah. And the other hat that I'm wearing is for the Transforming Foundation Industries Network Plus. And, and that's about how do we take some of the things that we're learning in the steel industry and, and use those to benefit other foundation industries, so paper, cement, uh, glass, bulk nice. chemicals, for example. And, uh, ceramics and how are we going to be benefit those other um, those other sectors and then also looking at well what are they doing in those sectors and what can we learn in the steel industry and apply back in the steel industry yeah. uh, and and it's for, for the transforming foundation industries project that's broader than just steel it's also about all of the other metals producers so your aluminium titanium and those those other sectors within the UK that, that can benefit from that and a much yeah. wider range of um, a foundry and uh, specialist, specialist metals providers um, across the UK. Yeah and it's interesting it seems to be a theme of today and although I introduced you to Swansea University you're actually one of us aren't you you know you're a, <laughs> kind of a, a steel guy through and through aren't you and it, and and, and uh, you know we're grateful for all the support you give us over the years but you know when you talk about other industries there and other metals this is a metals expo it's not a, a steel expo I was talking to Gareth Stace earlier from UK Steel and he was saying how beneficial it is to open our eyes to these other industries and he was talking about metals industries but there you talked about paper and concrete and so forth to say what are the learnings because there have got to be a lot of issues especially when we talk about sustainability decarbonisation innovation you know I was talking to Matthew Teague earlier about modern methods of construction some of the solution technologies there's got to be a lot of common ground there hasn't there for us well there's some of the really obvious things like uh, heat for example so most of these industries you know fall into that caption of, of energy intensive so they share a lot of challenges in terms of waste heat how are we going to utilize that how are we either going to re-employ that back into the system or how are we going to distribute that for for other benefit whether that's social social housing for example so you know some of the social good that some of these industries can be doing and, and re-employing back in some of it's around common cha te technical challenges around around digitization so a lot of these businesses are looking to more heavily instrument their processes, use models to help improve their productivity and, 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 and benefit um, their, their bottom line that yeah. way. But there are also some more specific things that you might not expect on sort of very specific areas of technology where, where um, industries can collaborate. So one really good example of that is a project that's running through the Transforming Foundation Industries Challenge between Tata actually uh, and NSG looking at how they can collaborate on coatings. Right. And there's a lot of work there where they're looking at using digital methods for coatings formulations and they're already identifying in working together across those two different sectors between steel and glass how they can collaborate uh, and and they're identifying that a lot of the challenges that they have in terms of improving their products and providing better durability and better function in applications for their customers they're almost identical mm -hmm. you know and I think the more that we can do that across the uh, transforming foundation industries challenge and the more we can bring people together through the network plus hopefully the more examples like that we'll be able to produce. Yeah, it is interesting because I think when people talk about the steel industry and its decarbonisation challenges, they think of all but and the blast furnaces and alternative technologies, but there's just as much challenge at the other end of the scale as, as I said, Matthew Teague was talking about the construction sector, about saying, well, you know, what are modern, modern methods of construction? What are the new technologies? What are the new innovative coatings and so forth that, that help that journey towards decarbonisation. But, you know, I wonder, I, I, I sit here and I wonder, you know, you, you must look at our industry from outside and you must kind of take a deep breath because we're on the verge of some step change that we've never seen before, to the scale we've never seen before because, you know, our industry, the Tata Steel in the UK, is, is facing arguably a single big technology change to make that big cha change in its, uh, its net zero ambitions. Mm -hmm. And that might change almost everything for you as you look in and, and say, well, how do we innovate? How, what are we doing about energy? Because all of a sudden we're going from a coal-based technology to potentially an electric-based technology. Where's that electricity come from? You know, are you having to kind of have one eye on the future and one eye on the, on the present? So I guess if you're in industry, this is kind of almost a stressful time because there's some very big decisions to be made with lots of money to be spent. And it's going to be have a very significant effect on the viability of the future of your business going forward. Um, 
from the outside looking in, as, as you put it, I mean, I guess coming from an academic perspective, there's never been a more exciting time to be involved in the metals industry. Yeah. You know, you know, whatever you're doing now, whoever you're speaking to, whatever projects you're involved in, they're going to have some influence on huge, very, very significant change. I think almost everything that we're working on at the moment, it's it's well beyond hypothetical. You know, we're not really sort of thinking, oh, it could be this or it could be that. We know that a revolution is is really upon us, yeah. and I. You mentioned, just to sort of link into the first thing that you mentioned, you mentioned about the end user. And I think that's where the revolution already is, right. that perhaps some of the metals producers haven't quite grasped yet, because I'm having similar uh, conversations with, you know, big, that you mentioned the construction sector, I'm talking to some of the construction companies, and I know that they've got projects on their books now that from the design stage have got specific very, very stringent EPD, mm. so uh, carbon um, intensity um, requirements for some of their steel products. About 40% of their um, of their carbon footprint is embedded in the materials that they use in these projects. And so there's this huge opportunity for uh, especially the steel industry to have uh, become decarbonisation providers. And there's a massive mm. mindset mm. switch, I think, that needs to happen there in the metals industry. Yeah. It's no longer about providing material. It's about saying, well, we can decarbonise 40% of your business. Yeah. Uh, not just, I mean, you, you consider steel and, and probably cement and concrete as probably the two biggest vectors in the construction area. Those two sectors are decarbonisation providers for the construction sector. Yeah. Yeah, an and so the whole, yeah. the whole way that the the um, the whole way that the supply chain is going to be structured is going to be dominated by that it's going to be do dominated by what the designer are asking for and the designers are asking for those things because they know that the public are going to be demanding this or government procurement yeah yeah um, and so I think that is um, probably we've got to respond to that so as technically focused people as, as academics um, as industrialists who, who, we've got to find those technical challenges yeah, um, yeah. and do something about them yeah, and it's really difficult, isn't it? You know, I was talking to Gareth Stace earlier about um, the need for collaboration. Everyone's talking collaboration. And I think, you know, we're, we're doing some amazing stuff, collaborating with academic and peer industries and so on and so forth. But collaborating with the government, Gareth Stace was saying about the need for this single technology change for the government to support it financially and legislatively. But I wonder from the world of academia, what support you think you can give uh, to the case for decarbonising industries such as steel to government and whether it's just a case of supporting us or whether there's anything more directly you can do to influence the stakeholders in government. So I think there is, is of course a role for, for academia. I think one of the big roles that we have in terms of the conversations that we have with government, perhaps I'll come on to what we're actually doing in a second, is that there is a degree of impartiality that comes with that. I mean, the, the credentials of the academics is about trying as far as possible to be factually correct, balanced and objective. Um, and so, you know, that's not prejudiced by commercial concerns. And I think that's where there's a real benefit there, because I guess in, especially in some of the unilateral discussions that happen between companies and, and, and people in government, there will be a natural an inevitable natural scepticism as you to would say you, that wouldn't you yeah yeah, yeah yeah you would say that because you're asking us for yeah. x million pounds or whatever it is yeah. to support this individual technology implementation or whatever it is yeah. i think the role of the academics in this is really to, to to have those um to have those discussions where we're providing some of the evidence base that's what sustain is trying to do mm. and, and we're involved in um also uh, directly involved in some of these four that government are organising. So there's there's working groups at the moment trying to connect the scrap supply chain to the steel makers at the moment, and we've got a representation on that. Um, we're we're really trying to to feed more directly into government in terms of providing advice and and, and, and thinking about how they need to structure their their policies um, yeah. into the future. Yeah, and I think that input into the, into the end users is also important. And one of the things I slightly worry about is that kind of the end users in construction will be the designers or specifiers or the architects will be putting pressure on their their suppliers or the, or the contractors and the contractors will be putting pressure on the, the system supplier and, and, and all through the chain they're just pushing it back saying the steel industry's role is to reduce its carbon footprint and that's it when actually you know surely there's a role for, for the experts in the steel industry and come together with people like yourself to go right down to the sharp end and say if you think about this in advance there's a whole load of stuff we can do to help. Mm. You know, the answer from the steel industry is not just to care about replacing a blast furnace with an electric arc furnace. There's a whole lot more we should do. Is that is that still true? Do you think? 
It, it is very true. Uh, I, I think one of the if you zoom out a little bit about what's the role of metals and again I'll sort of come back to more of this about providing a service or providing a solution there aren't many people in the supply chain who have a detailed knowledge of the material so that the, the people in the construction area I hope they don't if they're watching this they don't <laughs> mind me saying this that you know they'll buy on a spec and yeah. they know that the spec will deliver a certain function so whether that's form or mechanical properties or how long it's going to last in service yeah. um, corrosion whatever um, and then they say, right, okay, it'll perform against that spec, and it'll go. But, but the future of construction, the future of most materials use, is going to be about managing that material through its life cycle. To do that, you've got to understand a lot about the material, how it's going to behave, what it's going to do. Mm. And if you're going to be able to do that, you need to have detailed knowledge of the material, how it was produced, the nuances of that particular batch could make a difference to yeah, some yeah. of these things. And the steel industry, or the metals providers in the UK, they have all of that knowledge. Mm. And at the moment, they're not making best value of it. Mm. At the moment, they're just selling on a spec and it's going out the door. Yeah. When really, they have that opportunity to engage more directly with those end users. From an academic perspective, in some of the direct um, conversations that I'm having, again, in the construction sector, you know, I'll give you one example. It's never that simple. So uh, one uh, person from a large construction company was having a conversation with me and they were saying that we're... We've, we've received a mandate in our design spec of a certain proportion of recycled content in all of the products that we've got to use. Right. But a lot of the, 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 the beams, for example, in, in this example that we need that provide the open plan space that the designer wants and allows us to you know, drill holes in certain, have the properties that allow us to drill holes in certain places so that we can run all of the cabling yeah. so that they can get all of that high, te high tech building management systems and all that sort of stuff in place. The only place we can source that from at the moment is from virgin material because we don't have a strong enough grasp of the the hundred percent scrap fed material supply chain to be able to deliver products that have that high enough yeah. grade yeah the people who are designing the buildings don't understand it yeah. they're perfect it's perfectly valid for them to say <laughs> yeah. put more recycled material in yeah. because if they put more recycled material in they're they're assu instantly assuming that they're going to reduce the carbon footprint of the material but what yeah. they don't realize is that if they do that it's going to have a potential effect on the properties and the lifetimes of, that those materials might have in service, which yeah. doesn't deliver the function for the building that they envisage in the first place. Yeah. And they're sort of providing a restriction against their own vision. It's a real complex story, isn't and it? And so there is a, there's a real role for that materials knowledge to feed, as you said, right to the sharp end. And I think yeah. unless it does, we're going to make a lot of unintended mistakes yeah. in our pathway yeah. to net zero, particularly in the construction sector. Now I know this exhibition here today is the first of its kind where the metals industry has come together and great to see you guys here as well, but uh, you know, what do you think the benefit of bringing the industry together like this is on a, on a regular basis? Because we haven't really done it since at least before the pandemic and maybe longer than that. Well we spoke earlier on about sharing common goals across different foundation industries, obviously that's even more true just within the metal sector itself. Yeah. Um, I think it, there's a nice social element to this as well. It just reminds us that there is a critical mass still in the UK, yeah. both from the industrial perspective in terms of, and, and we, here we've got not just producers, but fabricators, people who are selling uh, characterization equipment, people supporting on uh, supply chain, people supporting on digitalization. It becomes increasingly obvious that actually we do have a lot of the pieces of the puzzle that are required to transform mm. the metal supply chain in the UK and a good mix of, of, of the sort of the forward thinkers from the academic side and some of those technology providers and the, the big players um, from a production perspective as well. Yeah. It reminds us that all of those things are here all, and all we've got to do is just coordinate ourselves. And, and, uh, yeah, and, and simple as that. Yeah. Well, it's better than starting from from having nothing there yes, it is, yeah. and, and, and I think that's yeah. what the Metals Expo has really, has really you know, yeah. demonstrated to me. That's the big takeaway that I'll take from, yeah. from the shows. Listen, Cam, thanks very much for your time. I know you've got a busy stand to, to man and uh, lots of people to talk to. But, Cheers. yeah, really good to see you again. And uh, thanks for your insight into to where we're at. And I'm sure we'll come across you again shortly. Thanks very much, Cam.